Welcome to Permission to Kick Ass, a podcast about leaving self-doubt in the dust, punching fear in the face, and taking bold action toward your biggest dreams. I'm Angie Coley, and let's get to it. Hey, and welcome back to Permission to Kick Ass. With me today is my new friend, Lucy Bedewi. Say hi. Hi. I'm so excited. Uh, We were uh, getting off to a long-winded start there before we started recording because we were just (laughs) chats to meet each other. I think those are the best ones where it takes me like 15 minutes to realize like, oh shit, we got to record. Yeah. I'm like, maybe people should hear this. I know. I I should probably just set it to auto record so they can <laughs> hear the banter or maybe like release some bloopers or something at some point, maybe for, for the future. And we'll have to do a part two so we can catch all of the banter. In the meantime, tell us a little bit about you and your business. Yeah. So I'm really excited to be here. I like fell in love with the name of your podcast as soon as I saw it. Um, and I'm a copywriter for primarily really personality packed female entrepreneurs. Um, so the reason I say personality packed is not because this is one kind of woman versus another kind of woman, but I believe that there is a bold woman who wants to take up space in each one of us, but sometimes it's really freaking hard to put it on a Google Mm -hmm. doc when you have to write your website. So I like to think I am the middle woman between what you feel in your head, what you feel in your heart and what you put on the page to get more clients, get more sales and scale a business. Oh, I love that. And it's so ingrained. I think it's very, very important to have somebody that can show you that side of yourself, right? Because it's so hard to see when it's you turning the mirror back on you. But I do remember uh, how easy it is to fall into that trap of like the corporate speak, the stuff that we were Mm -hmm. brought up to realize is or to recognize as professional, quote unquote. And I I was at a mastermind once where I was reading a new draft of my website copy to somebody and uh, they had just heard me ranting like five minutes before about something I was frustrated by. So I'm reading this website copy and one of my friends, I love her to death. And also sometimes I'm like, ah, she goes, blah, blah, blah. Where's Angie? I was reading my website to her. She goes, I want the one that was just like ranting and venting five minutes ago. She's the interesting one. Like, where's the kick kick life's ass, Angie? I'm not getting any of this here. And I was like, I mean, you're right, but that stings. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's so hard, especially if you come from the corporate world or you're currently in a nine to five, or even if you had like a particularly strict English teacher, like mm-hmm. that that's the stuff that's like ingrained in us. We're like, okay, I need to have a full sentence and perfect punctuation. And it's like, no one cares. Am I talking with perfect grammar? No, like mm-hmm. you really need to just speak like you. And, and sometimes it means like lighting a candle, saying a prayer and telling your whole family to get out of the house, but whatever it takes, you got to like crack open whatever it is that's inside of you and write and make it sound authentic to who you are and who you want to be. Exactly. Say it your own damn way. This is the new world, baby. Like consider this the wild west of business, right? Before there was those suit and tie wearing motherfuckers that were gatekeeping the crap out of it. The knowledge was held by a very few people and you either had to like kiss all kinds of butt to get there or like have a whole bunch of money to get access to that knowledge. Now it's all out there. It's all out there on the internet. Yeah. And the real thing is for you to be completely and wholly, like, why would you even want to sound like those guys from the 70s and 80s in the suits? Why? No. Even if you are a guy in a suit, listen to this. You have permission to remove the suit. Yes. Or if you want to be in the suit, but you want to be actually more interesting than just being a quote unquote suit. (laughs) Dare to be There's human. lots of flavors of suits these days. Yes. Oh my gosh. And if the suit is the feature, hey, geek out on the fashion, baby. It's all good. <laughs> um, so, oh, this is all fantastic. What got you into writing as a career? Yeah. So I was always that kid that loved to write. I I had my first journal when I was six years old. I was like that freaky kid that was like saying her alphabet at 18 months. And my mom's like, Oh, wow. What did I give birth to? Um, (laughs) And I would just write fiction stories on lined paper. And you know, if you've ever written on lined paper, you know, that stuff is really hard to keep in a pile. So like she would come into my room and just like paper would be flying all over the room. And she's like, okay, I raised a serial killer. This is so weird. (laughs) 
weird. <laughs> like who writes 30 pages of short stories like all the time, but it was just how I would express myself. Writing was my medium. So when I grew up and, you know, went to high school, went to college, I was always drawn to those like creative writing groups. And I started writing for Spoon University and I would go on these crazy diets and talk about how I almost died and they went viral. Um, so that's kind of like the natural progression of becoming a writer. And then the more serious part is I got my degree in marketing. I always loved business. I always loved helping women. And like, frankly, it was just something I was good at as a natural writer and a natural marketer. I was like, okay, I, I have something to start with here. So I put the two together, start my own, started my own business and just decided, you know what? Corporate life is not for me. I'm a little bit of a career rebellion. So, um, I was like, you know, we're in a pandemic. This is my chance to just go for it, fail hard and see what happens. Oh, I do love that. And I think that we have so many similarities and a couple of interesting differences too, because I taught myself to read at three. And I think my mom had a similar reaction because I can, I can memorize stuff really well. So I'd like these Disney read along yeah. tapes, you know, turn the page here. And I remember <laughs> very distinctly recognizing the word the, and then like from then on, I just, I could recognize words and I translated that to other books and it, and it took off from there. The only difference is I was always drawn to that. And I was the kid telling stories, holding court at daycare. It was fascinating. But somewhere along the way around high school and college, I got that message from outside of myself that was like, writing is really hard. Nobody makes it as a writer. You shouldn't mm -hmm. do that. You're setting yourself up for a life of struggle. And that, you know, I'm kind of, I, I understand why people around me thought that they were helping me in sharing that message with me. But it also meant that I didn't discover that I was a really good writer for like 10 years after yeah. all of that. And then once I embraced it and was like, no, nah, man, this is fun. I got to write a whole snarky campaign in a corporate office about uh, uh, the Summer Olympics for a hardware store. I think that was the most fun campaign I ever wrote <laughs> because I didn't understand why, why somebody was requesting we do an Olympics ad. And I was like, we're a hardware store. And they're like, but everybody's advertising is special for the Olympics. I'm like, we literally have nothing to do with the Olympics. Like, we don't even have outdoor games for people's homes. <laughs> we can fix a pipe. Yeah. I think that's really interesting how uh, some writers just know from the, from the moment that they can sling a word, read a book, that like, this is where I want to be. And some people kind of get an inkling, but then like, and I'm talking about myself here, step back out yeah. of fear and go, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. Yeah. And that's so valid. Like, I mean, I know, like, I, I love my dad to pieces and he always told me I wanted to be a women's studies major. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, you can be an engineer. He's like, your choice is you can be a mechanical, an electrical, a chemical. He's like, you can choose any type of engineering you want to be. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm so bad at math and science. So he's like, okay, let's compromise. Like, how about you become a business major? And like, in retrospect, like that was a really good move for me and good move for my career. But I think it just kind of goes to show that like, you know, people are going to have opinions. And even if they want the best for us, sometimes like if a, a career is new or if there's a new way of pursuing a lifestyle that someone isn't accustomed to, they might be scared for you in a way that you might not have that fear had you not had their perspective. That's true. That is so true. So I remember the, the message that I got from my dad was not engineer. It was a doctor or lawyer. You're very smart. You should be a doctor or lawyer. <laughs> I don't remember why I rebelled against doctoring, probably because I like weekends too much and don't like the idea of being on call. Um, lawyering, it was definitely like, um, well, yeah, I got the arguing part down, but I can't deal with pantyhose. And I'm sure the, the first moment that a judge back talks me or a client back talks me, I'm going to jail for contempt. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to wear a suit. Can you imagine me in a suit? Like they don't get to see the video here, but you're you're seeing me here in my uh, hotel room in Louisville in my short sleeves because it's hot out today with my tattoo showing. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> tell me again why you're innocent, motherfucker. I don't buy it. <laughs> I'd hire you. Defense, defense. You would start a cheer in a courtroom too. Make it into a circus. Mm, yeah, I think that would go viral in the TikTok world. It should, it would, I've gotten into TikTok lately and it's horrible and it's wonderful. I got to tell you, their algorithm is good. If you're not already on TikTok, don't, because they will catch you real quick and they'll figure out your interests and mm, they suck you in. But TikTok also gives me hope being on the, I, I'm technically classified as an elder millennial, even though I don't understand it. I grew up analog, you know, with no cell phones, no internet. And then I transitioned to digital as I was graduating high school and going to college. Um, 
Yeah, the new generation on TikTok gives me hope. They're out there talking about relationships, communicating, self-development. Oh. Yeah, like I'm finding like, I don't know, like recover from narcissistic abuse TikTok. Yes. And I'm like, since when did like TikTok bring therapy to all? Mm-hmm. Dating and relating mental health, not going it alone. A lot of humor. Of course, I've got some cats thrown in there because I travel with my cat. Um, but yeah, TikTok gives me a lot of hope for the future generations. I just got to say. And if you yeah, get sucked yeah. in, don't don't blame me. You'll be there for three hours. <laughs> the, the, the shiny tangents that we go off on on this show. So, I mean, you started this business because you really wanted to help people and you've got this knack for it. Um, what let you believe that you were on the right path? Like what kept you going? Yeah. So it was a couple of things. Something's very positive. Something's very negative. Um, like mm. I think all people experience for all major life transitions. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the bad. Whenever someone's like, you want the good news or the bad news first? It's like, just, just give me the bad news. Yeah. Um, so I worked, um, for a job for 90 days, um, mm. and I was fired. And I wasn't just like cutely fired where it's like, oh, we're making some cuts. And I think your role is going to be replaced. It's like the founder, the HR person, and a lot of people came in and were like, we're letting you go. You don't even do your last two weeks. You're leaving today. Wow. And it was my fault. Um, I'm not going to lie to you all. Um, so essentially I, I was asked to give an opinion and, um, everyone knows that when you're in a company and they ask you to give an opinion, you're supposed to agree. Um, and I dissented from the direction of the company and mm -hmm. I didn't just dissent. I actually dissented and wrote three pages on why I dissent. Mm. Um, so I really let my opinion fly. It was a work, it was a work environment that I just, just didn't align with who I was. I felt like it was really messing with my, my mental health. And I was like, you know what, this is like my now or never moment. I'm either going to turn this role into something that's productive and healthy, or they're going to let me go. So it yeah. wasn't like a, Oh my God, I'm so good at my job. How could they let me go? It was like, I definitely caused this. Um, so that kind of started a spiral of like, well, I don't, I don't know if I'm like meant to work under someone. I think I'm meant to make change. And I think I'm meant to help other women tap into their power and make changes too. So mm -hmm. that was kind of like my big push for like, okay, I think, I think I can start this. I think I can do this. And I feel so fortunate that I have like friends and family that are like, you know, you got this, like, go do that. Cause I think that's huge having mm -hmm. that community. Um, and then on top of that, I also graduated into a pandemic. So it's not like full-time jobs were like happening for people yeah. who didn't like secure them in junior year. Um, so I was like, okay, well, this is my chance. I can't see any of my friends. Um, I can't do most things that I enjoy doing because I'm an extrovert. Um, mm -hmm. so I was like, this is my time to like throw myself into this new business and work 14 hour days and just try and get it off the ground. And I'm very anti-hustle culture, but I will say like having that period of just intense focus, I think is what allowed me to scale so quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm against, I say hustle and grind is hustling and grinding yourself into an early grave. I don't buy it. I worked in yeah. Silicon Valley. I did the 19, 20 hour days for that har hardware store, ironically. Um, <laughs> and that said, I don't think that hustling is a bad thing. I think there's a time to hustle and it should be like 10 to 20% of your overall time. If your hustle yeah. time is 80 to 90% and your relaxation coast time is 10 to 20%, you are wildly out of balance in danger of burnout. That's what I will say. Um, yeah. There's a time for hustle, everything in moderation, including both hustling and relaxation and even moderation in moderation. It's a time mm -hmm. to go hard and a time to chill out. So yeah, I love that. And I think there was something really important that you said that it seems to be a recurring theme for today, which is having a support network, which some of us are uh, fortunate to have. And many of us are not so fortunate to have. But the cool thing mm -hmm. out here is this here internet that you're listening to us on uh, means that you can find your group of weirdos that will support you and cheer you on. And like, it, I mean, just yesterday, I mentioned briefly that I'm in Louisville and through a moment of sheer serendipity, a group of women that I know was here about an hour away at a retreat in Loretto, which is like where all of the big bourbon distillery, Maker's Mark, uh, Jim Beam, all of the distilleries are down there. And so they invited me to dinner and I drove down there among all of these distilleries, this beautiful countryside to hang out with these women and was just blessed by the fact that there were several of them that I had known for years online and we've never met before. 
And I don't, I'm sure you have had that feeling by now because it's more common these days. But I remember in the early days of the internet, it was just bizarre that you walk into a room with all of these people that you know, but you don't actually know. Mm -hmm. I have never seen this person before in my life, but I've seen them on so many Zoom calls. And I got so many hugs and was welcomed into that circle last night. And just the theme of the night wound up being serendipity. And I remember thinking, you know, this is kind of a long rambly way to say my main point, but um, I didn't get that support growing up. People didn't, mm -hmm. where I come from, people didn't believe writing was a, a career. Um, the partners that I chose, I was not always great at choosing romantic partners. And they were, as a result, not very supportive of my dreams and aspirations. But when I found that online tribe of people that were either doing what I wanted to do or they're working toward what I wanted to do, and they rallied around me with like, yeah, you could do this. You could do this. Let's yeah. figure out how to do it together. That made all the difference in life. No. And you raised such a good point. Like I'd even say like the, like everyone's like, Oh, women tear down other women. I'm like, I've never had that experience in the female entrepreneurship world. I could like post on my Instagram tomorrow. Like guys, I want to only eat coconuts and become a nudist. And I would have so many people sliding into my DMS and be like, yes, you mm -hmm. do that. Like you we are girl. the most supportive people on the planet. And I'm sure that there are some catty folks out there, but you know, I don't know. I've come to that point in my career and my personal growth journey where I realized that that speaks more to them than it does to anything that I'm doing. Because yeah. if I'm bringing my best intents out there into the world and trying to put something good out there into the world and somebody goes, you bitch, as a result, yeah. I'm like, okay, we cross wires here somewhere. Cause that was like the least bitchy thing I could do. You want to try it? Bring her out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I've just found that a lot of the negativity and a lot of the, the hate and, and like, I can just even speak to the people listening. Like if you're experiencing negativity and hate, I guarantee you're not experiencing it from people whose lives you want to switch lives with yes. or people who are where you want to be. You're going to be getting it from people who are jealous of you, people who want to see you fail or people mm -hmm. who simply don't know, or like, don't understand what you're trying to do in its entirety. You're never yeah. going to see that from like the person you're following. And you're like, Oh my God, I want to be her, or I want to have her business, or I want to have her success. Those are the people who are going to be like screaming your names from the rooftops and being like, yes, you got this. Oh yes. There's a certain, and, and I remember when I, switched from the group that was more of the crabs pulling you back into the bucket because we mm -hmm. all must suffer right and there's a little bit of fear a lot of fear in those folks and so mostly i just send them a lot of love and go man it doesn't have to be this way but they're yeah. usually just projecting their own fears onto you and mm -hmm. because they've been burned they think they're trying to help you so i just i treat that with a lot of love and compassion i know that you're trying to be helpful and you're not actually being helpful right now but these folks uh that have experienced a certain level of success here's the coolest fucking thing not a single damn one of them achieved that success all by themselves with no help from anyone. Screw you all. Every single one of them had help from somebody that believed yes. in them, from someone that poured some resources or some training or some support into them. And a lot of us see it as our duty to turn around and send the elevator back down for mm -hmm. somebody that's trying to get up to where we are. We got here because somebody sent the elevator down for us. Like, I love that about the entrepreneurial world that people that are experiencing success are like, well, cool. Who else can I help get here? Yeah. Like we have nothing to hide. Like yeah. if you notice that someone is like shady or like, you know, obviously like if someone's a coach, like you're going to have to invest to have their time. And I feel like that's also, I, I don't want to speak to like, oh, people you're entitled to people's time or you're entitled to people's expertise because, you know, people did get there. They did put it in the blood, sweat and tears. So yeah. I just want to add that as a quick caveat, but most of the time, like when you do see someone and, you know, you, you do like immerse yourself in their content, or you maybe join one of their programs, they genuinely have your best interests in mind. And if they're shady and they're not, um, generous with that knowledge, um, it, it probably means that they're not that successful. Yeah. I've seen that too. Like the, the most successful people I know, and we're, we're talking about people who I've seen the inside of their business. Mm -hmm. I have seen the revenue reports. And so I know that they are successful. Uh, they're also some of the most generous, most supporting, most caring people. And I like that you brought up the fact that you're not entitled to their time. That gives me an opportunity to clarify that, like, make the ask, but don't expect anything in return. Because the worst yeah. that they can say is like, no, I can't really help you. Or they ignore it because they're busy. It's never 
really a personal, like, don't bother me. Like so many of us can get in our heads if I can't ask for help because I'm bothering them. Um, I've had some big name people that I asked for help or I just asked a question to at events or privately and they answered me. Yeah. Some people will absolutely do that, but you got to be the one to ask. So I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it comes down to this, like, just remember that people got successful because they had really strong boundaries. Um, Mm -hmm. So if they, if you make an ask and they say no, or they don't respond, it's usually because they've done the work to be like, okay, I can't respond to everyone or else I'm never going to be able to like hug my dog. Um, So I would say, make sure you put it on them, especially if you notice they have a team or they're in a launch. Like these are all totally valid reasons why they probably Mm -hmm. can't give you their time or they can't even answer your question. And it has nothing to do with you. So I would say, you know, just respect that and realize that like, maybe if that makes you feel a certain way, it means that in your business, you need to create some stronger boundaries. And I think that goes back to what you were saying in terms of projecting, um, Mm -hmm. because really it's all positive or at a minimum neutral. Um, a lot of the things are not meant to be negative. A lot of the times when things are negative, they are a projection. And if you're growing a business, you cannot stick around in that kind of energy because it's, it's not going to help you. You absolutely cannot. And I know the more that I'm learning about coaching and becoming a better coach, the more I'm starting to understand how like this fear creeps in and like really it it makes us do some things that are detrimental to other other people's growth in the interest of we really care about them. And one of the concepts that stuck out in, to me as I've been studying coaching is this this one uh, leader named Rhonda Britton teaches this concept of seeing other people with innocence, mm-hmm. believing that they are innocent. And that has changed how I interact with everybody. Like it's gotten to a point, one of my favorite clients calls me a one woman bomb squad because he knows I can go in and diffuse any situation, <laughs> come out with the relationship intact. And I do that because I give a damn, right? And it's not mm-hmm. because I'm manipulating people, but I'm genuinely going in to any tough situation, especially one where I'm feeling mad or annoyed or slighted yeah. and going, I bet something is happening. I bet they're going through a tough time. I bet mm-hmm. I read that wrong. I bet there's a piece of information I'm missing. What if I choose to see this person as doing the best that they can in this moment and that they had absolutely no ill intent toward me? Oh, man. Yeah. We build some deep relationships when you can, I can't remember, my friend said it was a, a bias in, and I can't remember the name of it, of course, where it's like this tendency, this human tendency to, I made a mistake, mm-hmm. but you did it on purpose, you yeah. jerk. <laughs> like, what if they made a mistake too? What yeah. if we could start there? Ah, oh, fantastic. I love where this conversation is going. It's very ADHD. Um, <laughs> let's go back to the writing business. So you talked about, 14 hour days and a lot of hustle. Uh, Tell me a little bit about those early days. What kept you going? Yeah, um, I think part of it was my, my drive to just like live life on my own terms. Um, I think like when you're, when you're really fighting for something, when you're fighting for the ability to go to like a 2 PM yoga class or just go on vacation with your mom, because you can, and you don't have to ask anyone for PTO or live in any country that you want to, like, these are such driving factors. And even going deeper, if it's not for yourself, it's the idea that like, if you have a child, you will be able to spend time at home with your baby and you won't have to put them in full-time childcare unless like, that's what you want to do. So like, mm-hmm. it just gives you options. And I guess when I was thinking about my life, I was like, I want a life where I have choice. And for me, the corporate grind is not choice because, you know, your employer is like at a minimum come in nine to five, but realistically who's working nine to five. A lot of my friends are working 12 hour days. Um, and so I think that's what kept me going was the dream, the desire. Um, and I, I mean, I'm really happy about those early days. I have to say they weren't easy, but every time I signed a client, I would like, I was living at home because pandemic, I would like run downstairs and like tell my mom and be like, someone Yay! asked me to write a social media caption. I made $50. And Whoa! it's like, we would celebrate and we would like have ice cream that night with our tiny little three person family, like me, my mom, and my dad. And I think having someone to like celebrate the baby wins with was huge. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to actually celebrate those too, because it's too easy to get sucked into that trap where we're always focused on the next thing, but never turning around to look at how far we've come. Yeah. Like, it is so easy to look up at that mountain in front of you and be like, oh, I suck. I don't want to do this. It looks really hard. Uh, what if I quit? Is everybody going to think bad things about me? And then you turn around and realize, well, I just came like 400 miles and there's like three mountains behind me. 
Yeah. I think I'm doing all right. I think I'm <laughs> doing all right. Um, and all of that speaks to, you know, everything that you just said, what kept you going about building the life that you want to live speaks to, in an interesting way, I think boundaries. I think yeah. a lot of folks are mistaken about boundaries and they think it's about laying down the law, telling people how it's going to be. <laughs> I think real boundaries stem in it. And that interpretation of boundaries, I think, is a control issue. And let's get real, people that are listening to this. You can't control a damn thing in life except for yourself. Yes. <laughs> Don't try and control other people. It ain't going to work. But what a boundary really is, is it stems from what's important to you. Like you said, you wanted to build a life that you love. You want to be able to go to 2 p.m. yoga classes. I want to be able to jump into a hot air balloon and go to llama yoga because those are weird things that I want. I want to be able to meet up with a local friend in the town that I happen to be in. Uh, and I don't want to be at the computer from nine to five, never moving my body, yeah. never being out in the sunshine. Those are core values of mine. Those are important things to me. And therefore, the people that I bring on understand these things about me from the very beginning. Yeah. And they also understand those are non-negotiable. So if you're asking me to be on a meeting on Saturday, no. Yeah. I'll talk to you on Tuesday. Tuesday is my call day. Tuesdays and Thursdays. Those are when I schedule my calls. Do you need an extra meeting outside of that? I might be willing to work with you, but not on Friday when you're asking me to meet tomorrow. Nope, not happening. Yeah. And I think people just have to remember that like, no is a full sentence. I think a yep. lot of the times, especially women feel the need that if they're going to lay down a boundary, they have to justify it. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you can justify it if you feel like that relationship and that person is worth it. But usually if it's something at work, it's just a simple no. And then that person can choose if they want to engage with you or not. Exactly. I was so scared to set limits on my call times for so long because I thought, you know, I'm a creative person. I need to be able to task switch and, and take calls and do meetings and all that stuff. But when I finally let my VA talk me into theming my days, so Tuesdays and Thursdays are my call days. As I mentioned, Wednesdays are my podcast days. Yeah. It actually allowed me an enormous amount of freedom. And in two years of limiting my calls to afternoon, that was important too. I don't <laughs> want to get up first thing in the morning and have to talk to somebody before I've had my coffee. Um, I've had two people in two years have an issue with not having availability. Most of them just look at that calendar link and go, oh, well, crap, she can't meet this week. Next week. And it's a total yeah. non-issue. <laughs> Yeah. And if something is urgent, I mean, like, it, like, I think that's the cool thing about boundaries. It's like, you can choose like where you want to like, kind of be a little more fluid and you can choose where you're like, no, this is like, I, I want my weekend. I, I want to go away this weekend. I'm tired. Um, mm -hmm. and I want to go to the beach. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where it's like, nothing is law. It's just your personal comfort with stuff and that can change. So don't feel like once you set a boundary, that boundary can never change. Cause yeah. I know I sometimes fall into that trap of like, okay, well, if I decide to do something, then like I have to do it. Um, but then I'm like, no, like you can change your mind. And I feel like I'm always telling my friends this too. We forget mm -hmm. that we can change anything in our business business based on how we're feeling a certain month, a certain week, a certain year. Exactly. Actually, that's a very timely reminder because I am usually very protective of my weekends. They're either travel time or they're exploration time where I'm driving between cities or I'm going out and doing fun things. Um, and this weekend, I've got a full day VIP day on Saturday. That's the yeah. only day that our client could work. It's a brand new offer for me and uh, for my partner. And we wanted to build that quickly and support our client. Uh, and so I went, okay. I'm willing to give up a Saturday for that. I really believe in this thing that we're building together and I want to get it off the ground. So like, hell yeah. And I love that you mentioned that, that you get to be flexible. You get to break your own rules. And also remember that that's like an 80-20 thing. Hold your own rules as much yeah. as you can so that you have that flexibility to break them when you see an opportunity to do so. Love it. Mm. <laughs> this is great. Um, did you ever encounter a point in your business where you were like, oh, this is so hard. Why did I do this? Yeah, I think it got really like in the pan, like the pandemic was problematic. Mm -hmm. so, like I'm not even going to sugarcoat that. But there was something about the pandemic of like waking up every day, working at my desk in my bedroom for 14 hours, like eating dinner with my family, that it was like very easy to focus on work. I really got tested when people started going out again. And I was like, okay, well now I have to be like an entrepreneur who like has friends. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big transition for me. And just realizing that's kind of when I did start thinking, okay, well, I can't get on the phone 
phone with everyone who wants to talk to me. Um, and that's when I had to start instituting the boundaries. Um, and I think that was one of the best like seasons of my business because I got a system specialist who was just like, yeah, no, yeah, you're not going to do that. Um, and <laughs> I, I need like very direct communication. So that was super helpful, but I think like making big personal life transitions and trying to run a business at the same time, whether that's like a bad week or I'm just not feeling well, or like a major life transition, it's like next level hard when your whole career is resting on you. Mm -hmm. I totally get that because I don't know how much of my story that you've heard, but uh, my whole digital nomads journey started as the result of an unexpected breakup. And I had just quit my job to start my business and my podcast and like everything was happening all at once. And I do remember arriving in New Orleans, which was my first stop. And just like unpacking my stuff and being like, what the hell did I just do? <laughs> How am I going to make this work? Yeah. And my my old job offered to take me back when they found out I was going through this breakup. But something in my gut was like, mm, nope, I'm, yeah. it's time. It's time for change. Time to do Move something forward. And there's nothing quite like, you know, to go back to the beginning, your own origin story, just investing in yourself and being like, this is what. I need to do right now. Let's see mm-hmm. how it works. Love it. Love it. Well, that it's good to know that you didn't, that, that the challenges were balancing work and life and that that was an interesting transition for you. What would you say to you, you know, knowing what you know now, if you had to go back and start your business all over again? I would say start offering VIP days sooner. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I know there's a lot of creatives on this podcast, so this is going to be like very specific advice, but anytime you can make your time a specific chunk and you're not mm-hmm. doing long drawn out timelines or people that, you know, I mean, obviously we hope most of our clients are kind and sweet and responsive, but that's not the reality. So if you have like six projects that are just lingering and you can't sign mm-hmm. new projects because, you know, you're just in limbo, with like people who aren't getting back to you for edits, or maybe there's an action they have to take that takes so much mental energy. And I think as a business owner, you have to take all of that decision fatigue, all that mental energy and make it as low as possible because Mm -hmm. there's so many things already on your plate. So if you haven't played with like strategy sessions or VIP days, this is like your push to like go and structure something out. Absolutely. And I love that. And creating a productized service, something that you can duplicate over and over and over again. My creative, beautiful friends, it is not cheating. If you systematize something that actually gives you more room to be creative because you're not having to spend all of that precious mental energy building something from the ground up each time you can build on a frame and you can build like five different frames for you to choose from that you get to build on with every project. That's still plenty of room for creativity if you are using templates and systems to get things done. It's not cheating, damn it. Yeah, not cheating. <laughs> I, I only get ranty about that because I had that head trash at the beginning of my writing career that like it doesn't count if I'm not suffering for this art, if I'm not writing it from <laughs> like scratch. We're like painters that have to like mm-hmm. go through the depths of the heart to be allowed yes. to sell our art. Torture, dark night of the soul. <laughs> I had to bleed for this. And you know, some of my best work has actually been like gleeful, maniacally yeah. gleeful, me sitting there like so in love with this idea and laughing so hard that I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Like, and people shouldn't be like writing your stuff if they're tortured. Like, I'm just going to yes. put that out there as a PSA. You don't want a tortured copywriter. You want a copywriter who's like, I totally get your vision. And then they put it on paper and you're like, awesome. Mm-hmm. And talking to them makes you feel all energized and excited yeah. for the future of your business. Like imagine that joy as a business model. Crazy. That's also a recurring theme today, like doing <laughs> things that bring you joy and focusing yeah. on the life that you want to live. Who knew? So yeah, man, uh, tie, tie wearing guys. If you wear the tie, cause you like to keep wearing that tie. If you wear the tie, cause business tells you, you have to maybe take it off. Yeah. Maybe take they it probably off. won't fire you, but don't sue me if they do. <laughs> Sound legal advice on a podcast. Woohoo. All right. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. Tell us a little bit more about your business and maybe those VIP days. 
Yeah. So essentially the way I've kind of chosen to run my business is I want to help everyone, no matter what stage of business they're at. So I have offers. If you're like just starting out and you're like, I didn't even know copy was a thing I had to write. I have an (laughs) offer for you. If you're like kind of in the middle, you're growing, but you're like not fully ready to commit to me. That's fine. And I also have the VIP day or the done for you offer. And I do offer some longer, more drawn out projects if they're bigger. Um, So the done for you, I feel like is pretty self-explanatory. You're like, Lucy, I hate to write and I want you to write. So I make a lot of money. Then you come to me and you do that offer, but um, I'll just touch on for some of our newer people. So if you're newer, I have a template shop. And, um, so what that is, is it's not like a little packet that's like, go right. Yay. I'm your cheerleader. This is like (laughs) for the web copy template. I just finished it. It's 135 pages. I take you line by line on how to write your website and sound professional and get conversions. So you can do it on your own for a fraction of the price. Um, and I actually want to give you guys a little gift since you're listening to the podcast. If you use the code Angie 20, you're going to get 20% off the entire template shop. So if that sounds exciting, head on over to the template shop, use that coupon and um, just really make your website something that you're proud of. Um, And then I'll just briefly talk about the middle offer because it's spicy. Um, It's the copy roast. So essentially what I do is I go in there and I roast your copy. And by roast, I mean audit. So I'll go in, (laughs) look at your sales page, look at your web pages and tell you why I think it's not converting, help you optimize those headlines and give you um, verbal edits and actionable feedback. So it's not just like, oh, this isn't good because that's not helpful. Um, I'm going to help you make things really strong. And I like to joke, I'm much meaner on my sales page for that offer than I actually (laughs) am in real life. So it'll be a very productive conversation about how you can make more sales. Love that. All right. And where's the website where they can find all this stuff? Yeah. So head on over to myrighthandwoman.com, write spelled like writing or chat with me on Instagram. You can slide into my DMs. I'm real casual. Um, And my Instagram is at myrighthandwoman. Again, write is spelled like writing. Um, So those are my two main platforms. And I'm just really excited if you kind of resonated with me, resonated with this podcast to just talk to you a little bit more about your business and yeah, really just consider, consider me a resource. So please join me on Instagram or peruse the website and excited to have more interactions with everyone who's listening. Woohoo! This this is honestly the first time in the history of the show that I have been turned into a coupon and I kind of love it. <laughs> You're it an feels influencer. like a milestone in my career. Angie 20 is how you save on this. Hell yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. This has been so much fun and I will talk to you soon. Yes, we'll see you soon. So that is it another awesome episode of permission to kick ass on the books if you want to know more about the show if you want to know more about me angie coley and the mission i'm on to help entrepreneurs punch fear in the face and do big bold things then head on over to permission to kick ass.com that is all one word together permission to kick ass.com make sure to sign up for my email list so that you know whenever there's a hot fresh and ready podcast episode out for you and also on mondays i like to send out a little newsletter called kick monday's ass i'm sure you're totally totally surprised by that. So thank you for being here with me today. I'm Angie Coley. Make sure that you share this with a friend that needs to hear this message today. Like it, share it, comment wherever you're listening to this today. And let's go kick some ass.